This episode is brought to you by WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. At WeatherGuard, we support design engineers and make lightning protection easy. You're listening to the Struck Podcast. I'm Dan Blewett. I'm Alan Hall. And here on Struck, we talk about everything aviation, aerospace engineering, and lightning protection. All right, welcome back. This is Struck episode 18. Alan, what's going on? Hey, been a great week, Dan. Pretty busy. Things are starting to pick up. Uh, looks like air, aviation's getting a little little more busy. Flights are ticking up a little bit, so it's going to be a busy week. Yeah, you got another trip this week, don't you? Yeah, I have another one. So this is my second trip outside of Massachusetts. Uh, we're a little curious to see if the any changes have occurred in the uh, airport experience and on the aircraft. It seems like the, the Southwest Airlines, which we're traveling on, is still blocking out the middle seats. And there was a report by MIT I saw yesterday or day before that was talking about how that reduced um, exposure to COVID mm-hmm. by like roughly 50%, which which was interesting. Uh, but the last time we traveled to the airports, the airports seemed busy. They were really busy, but the parking lots were empty. <laughs> Which doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's what it was. Um, so yeah, it's gonna be a busy week. Well, I heard, yeah, I heard Delta is gonna keep uh, their middle seats blocked off until September. But then again, other uh, companies hadn't really followed suit, and of course, with American Airlines, they didn't even seem to enforce uh, one of our United States senators wearing a mask the whole flight. Apparently, so. It's not still spotty <laughs> regulation across the uh, industry. It well, seems it's like. not regulation. Right, uh, the FAA yeah, can't just can't oppose company anything. policies. It's company policies, yeah. right? And the companies can remove you from an aircraft for whatever reason they want. <laughs> it's denial of service. That's what it is. So yeah, uh, when we traveled uh, on the on the last flight, there was I think there was one or two people who weren't wearing a mask. But I, you notice what happens is they kind of get shuttled to the back corner of the airplane, which seems to be part of the approach that at least Southwest was taking at the time. And I've heard that from other airlines that they try to take people who decide not to wear masks for for whatever, it could be medical conditions. There's all a variety of reasons why that would occur. Oh, so they know ahead of time. So I was yeah. just thinking to myself, I'm like, well, how would they know yeah. if they're not on the plane yet? Yeah. But I guess some people... Hmm, some people with breathing problems, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big deal to have a mask on. It doesn't make it easier to breathe, that's yeah. for sure. Well, this is true. This is true. So in today's show, we're going to cover... Got a good good smattering of topics. Uh, we're going to cover Jaunt Air Mobility's uh, aircraft, which uses ROSA technology, which is a slow rotor, uh, which is really interesting. Uh, Airbus and some of their they have an extensive white paper they're talking about uh, the use of hydrogen fuels in the future. So we'll catch up on that. Uh, Embraer is developing a new turboprop, so they haven't really made a new one in a while. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then uh, Nextcom has a new design of a uh, flat panel antenna. So some interesting SATCOM news there. And then we're going to chat a little bit about the Textron explosion. And OSHA has just recently cited them. Uh, that was back in December, but still a really scary incident. That I think they were lucky to not um, have as nearly as much uh, injury. And then we're going to talk a little bit about fire suppressing foam, which is a crazy thing. That just This seems like a very toxic and just uh, it's it seems as I did research on this seems strange that it's hasn't been banned yet. But anyway, so let's start with uh, with Jaunt Air Mobility. So this is their attempt, and they're I guess partnering with Uber Elevate, and they make a lot of claims that this is a really great little aircraft, that it's fast, that it's uh, quiet, that it's smooth, you know, vertical takeoff and landing. Uh, but this is a gyrocopter. Am I right? Uh, essentially, it is. It's a what I would call a powered gyrocopter a uh, gyrocopter or an auto gyro is a think of it as a it has a main rotor blade on top but it's not powered and it needs forward thrust for the for the blade on top to start rotating to act like a propeller or a wing that's essentially what it does in this particular case uh, jaunt is actually powering that rotor on top of the aircraft to provide lift so they they power that rotor up to take off the, the vertical takeoff and then when they're flying forward they just kind of let it auto rotate what it looked like um, with the forward thrust provided by four electric engines two on each mm-hmm. smaller it's a really small wing just enough to put some propellers out there so it looks like 
So it's, it's yeah. sort of a combination of an auto gyro, power gyro, electric aircraft, somewhere in between all those things. Mm -hmm. Yet another kind of hybridized uh, design. Mm -hmm. So, what, well, I mean, these have been around for a little bit. So, yeah. like, what's the history of like safety and efficiency? It's a really, like I said, it's a unique. Because they said it can, I think it can rotate as slow as 80 revolutions per right. minute, maybe, where you can just very clearly see the rotor you can move, making its rounds. Yeah, you and the auto gyro is a way to fly slowly with, in a smaller aircraft. That's what it's been used for originally. And I, I don't remember where it was designed originally. I think it was in Europe, maybe in Spain, where the auto gyro was first invented. And it was a long time ago. Uh, but what... What it can allow you to do is really fly slowly across. Uh, I think they're using it for agricultural purposes originally. And that's where I've seen it used. Is where a regular aircraft is going to be flying at say uh, um, roughly a uh, hundred miles an hour, and this uh, auto gyro can fly much much slower than that, uh, and still get the cover the same amount of ground. So it's basically a, a simplified way of flying slower. Uh, so you, cause you don't need mm -hmm. that much forward thrust kind of a combination of helicopter or airplane so it's not helicopter where you can hover it's not an airplane where you're going 100 knots but it's somewhere in between that's the way to think about it for an urban transport it may be a good fit because ultimately um you you really you, you know you need that vertical aspect right you want to be taken off if you're on mm -hmm. top of a building when it lift off and go fly to the next building or you would take off from the building go fly to a restaurant or wherever you're going to i i'm I'm always dubious at anything that's rotating over my head, and uh, the you're not a big decapitation guy. I'm not, not into that. I'm it's... not. No, if you see helicopter crashes, <laughs> it'll really turn you off to helicopters. Uh, and in this situation, auto gyros, are, I think, are even worse because the blades tend to be floppy. Even though they're not moving all that fast, you get hit with a rotor moving even a couple RPMs. It's it's going to be severe damage. So. I think you got to balance those two off. The thing about Jaunt what was interesting, at least to me, was their little certification timeline. I think they're talking about starting the certification process in 2022. So they got some design phase, mm -hmm. company stuff they're going to go do, and then transition off into certifying for Part 27 and Part 29, which is the rotorcraft regulations from the FAA. Part 27 is essentially small rotorcraft. Part 29 is large rotorcraft. Not sure why this would fit. In between those two, I would consider it to be part 27, but maybe there's some technology about it that makes it part 29 or some aspects about the way it flies that would throw it into part 29. But they have like a three-year window to get that done. That will be very difficult. I haven't seen a lot of aircraft certification programs get, to get done in three years. Now, I've seen a lot of schedules that say three years or two and a half years from start to finish, but very few from start to finish get done in three years. It's most likely five uh, because there's always setbacks and delays, particularly some sort of new design. You just never can get through that hurdle. And more realistically, a lot of later programs have been, you know, new aircraft programs have been closer to seven. So there's there's a time clock that when you go to the FAA, you start that certification and say, I'm applying for a type certificate for this aircraft. Bing. That starts a clock, and I forget if that clock is three or five years. And after that three to five year window, I think it's three years, and you can ask for a year and a year extension. I think that's how it went. <clears throat> so what happens is you, you have your defined regulatory basis defined the day you apply, and then you get this grace period where if new regulations come in, you do not have to incorporate them. And if you go past that certain threshold, that th certain window, you have to reapply, and the FAA can apply new regulations. That's what kills a program because there's always new regulations, oh. right? So you have to go back and redesign your aircraft for these new regulations. I've been through a couple of those programs in which that has been done, and it is severely painful. And that's why that's why a lot of companies got smart and stopped uh, making the application. Just stop starting the clock. Don't start the clock until you're pretty sure you're going to finish it. Otherwise, you kind of get this snowball effect going on. Yeah, that's, man, that sounds crazy that, yeah, you've got to rush to finish that. Otherwise, now your whole, everything you're trying to get certified for has changed. That's terrible. Well, but, I mean, it makes sense because you don't want to get outdated. Like they'll grandfather you in for a little while, right, but not for right. half a decade. Right. Well, that, so that, that's what's sense. happening, right? So you'd apply and then if you had a concept for an aircraft, you would apply 
And then if it took you 10 years to finish it, well, you're still with the original regulations. Well, that doesn't make any sense either because the guy that, that started yeah. and finished a project in two years is getting penalized. Because <laughs> it, it eventually becomes a competitive marketplace. And the, the aircraft that is slightly less expense, which means it probably has less FAA, I don't know, you know, it's not directly related to this, but it's kind of related to this. If there's less regulations to comply with, it's probably less expensive to manufacture and to certify. So that gives them a competitive advantage on the marketplace. And then the, the company that has the super due for safety feature gets penalized. Speaking of another long road, so Airbus is considering the future of, uh, of propulsion, so hydrogen. Mm-hmm. This also has a really, I mean, this is a much longer timeline because there's just a lot of hurdles to get hydrogen power. But one of the interesting things that I um, noticed as I was reading through this white paper was just that, you know, it's going to be most viable for smaller aircraft. Yes. And that as it gets to, as the scale of the, you know, the amount of passengers they're carrying increases, the amount of hydrogen they have to be able to store on board increases. Mm -hmm. And so then the fuselage has to ex get extended. Right. And that's where the costs really ramp up. So what, what's your take on hydrogen? Well, the EU is really mandating it. So I'm not sure there's a way out of this. Airbus put out some nice mm -hmm. congratulatory words to the EU about hydrogen being the future and that Airbus was looking to participate in that future. You really don't have a choice, honestly. And if you're serious about putting some sort of hydrogen fuel tanks in an aircraft, there's a there's some problems with it, right? Because you want to, in order to get hydrogen condensed enough to get onto the aircraft, it's going to be in liquid form. When it gets in liquid form, it has to be really, really cold, which means you're going to need some sort of insulated, double-walled, triple-walled storage container on the aircraft. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why they're talking about basically extending the fuselage on the aft fuselage, basically putting the storage tank in the aft fuselage to, to store the hydrogen, which makes sense on a simplistic sense, but on a simple simplistic basis just because uh, a hydrogen storage tank is going to look something similar to a propane tank a very expensive propane tank where it's a cylinder and no. it's got caps on the ends but if you're going to use hydrogen you really need to rethink the way you build airplanes and is it makes sense to con use a conventional shaped airplane with it's got a long fuselage and then very slim wings because right now all the fuel is essentially stored in the very in the in the wings it's liquid and it can be stored at room temperature. So all the fuel goes into the wings. When you get to a hydrogen model, what's stored in the wings? Nothing. I, I guess the wings would be empty, mm -hmm. right? I guess you put luggage in Suitcases. there. Suitcases. Yeah. <laughs> little, ki little kids. The smallest kids can just crawl in there. It'd be like a jungle gym. be like a indoor yeah. play place. <laughs> It's the, you know, we got to we got to think big, Alan. We got to re re rethink all this. Well, you know. Sponsored by McDonald's. McDonald's, yeah. right. Have you seen the unibody? Airplanes have been like Boeing's been discussing with NASA for a couple of years where it just looks like a B-2. It would be a very thick B-2 triangular shape aircraft uh, where the passengers are all kind of in the middle and you don't have really have, don't have any windows. You ever, you ever see that, NASA? I haven't, no. Well, that makes a little more sense. If you think about like a B-2, which is just, just huge volume, and that's essentially what it is. It's just a flying wing concept and you don't have windows. Maybe then it makes more sense because you could put hydrogen storage cells inside of there instead of having this empty wing it may use the space more efficiently maybe that's what they're thinking but and if if i'm airbus and i think that's the way you uh, the to go forward is that that's the way to go forward i'm not telling boeing that and that's for darn sure <laughs> so i wonder if part of this white yeah. paper is just to say well here's conventional technologies here's how you get mod conventional technologies but in the real world you've got to take a clean sheet at it and start over and come up with some other design that's what I'm thinking. But hydrogen, you know, the thing about hydrogen is that it's really inefficient to make, especially if you use uh, electrolysis to make it. And Yeah, it's really expensive. They said that like that's the way you'd want to do yep. it to be carbon neutral right. is splitting water molecules, but it's really expensive. Yeah, because yeah, it's a very inefficient process. But at the same token, if you have, if you have a lot of unused power, particularly at nighttime, uh, and if you have a lot of renewable energy, if, if the wind is blowing at nighttime and you have no place to put it, why would you not use it to create hydrogen? It's inefficient. But at the same time, you're also making heat. All these processes make heat. And you, you, at, at some point, and I haven't heard a lot of discussion about this, which is odd, but if we're concerned about the global heating of the earth and 
carbon dioxide is a main contributor to that, isn't just plain making heat part of that discussion too? Because an, an inefficient process is a, is a heat-laden process. And to make hydrogen, it's, there's a lot of extra wasted heat involved, energy involved to do it. So um, I'm sure at some point we're going to see some discussions about the total heat generated by the hydrogen process versus um, other technologies like batteries that just don't use as much heat to store the energy. That's going to be the comparison over time because what the EU is saying and what the white paper is saying is is that it's, it's, there's no carbon dioxide created by the process. That could be totally true. That could be totally true, but there's other consequences for doing that. All right, so we're going to move on to our, our engineering segment. So we'll real quick touch on just some of the safety stuff that we've been kind of talking about with COVID-19, which is the, uh, there's a bunch of industrial adhesive films that they're using now. I know uh, Adhitech is one of them, and they're going to be putting these in cabins uh, maybe in the future here coming up. Mm-hmm. I've seen them actually in a building that I I frequent here in D.C., and it just uh, it just wraps around the the high touch points so like the 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 entrance bar of the the door handle yeah. that's the word i was looking for. i was looking for the word door handle <laughs> but these are wrapped around the door handles okay and uh i guess they sort of like self heal is what it kind of says and they're just like self cleaning these films um so it's interesting just like have an antibacterial antiviral microbial process but um, it's just a coating. I, mean, I guess that stuff is kind of the, right. Yeah, I guess that stuff's kind of the way okay. of the future. I don't know the brand name of the ones that I'm familiar with, like in real in real life. I don't think they're made by uh, Adhesive. Is, is it a very thin film? Is it clear? Like a clear film? It's not clear. You like you know it. Like you know it's there because they want you to grab it. Like that's where they want oh, you to touch the door. So is it colored though? Mm-hmm. Is, so not, or is it just like kind of milky colored? It just seems kind of. It just seems kind of. It's it's like. It just looks kind of medically like it's white, <laughs> but it's got a texture and it says it's got like little like little printing on it. And it like kind of says what it is, because, okay. again, they like the first time I encountered, I'm like, am I supposed to touch this? And then you look at it and you're like, yes, they want you to touch this because this is cleaning itself, essentially. So put your dirty, disgusting, poisonous hands here Yeah, well, how, because it's going to. Yeah. How many times have you avoided? Pretty interesting technology. Hands. Yeah, Don't we have a tendency to avoid? I've seen all kinds of contraptions lately to avoid touching door handles, and now we're saying touch away. Yeah. I suppose. Huh. Well, have you seen the the foot the foot things? Is that one of them you've seen? No, the foot thing to open a door. Uh, so yeah, so at WeWork, which you know they're doing just like any other business yeah. where there's a lot of people, and of course there's very few people in we most we we work locations here, but they have these little like door catches which they're not prominently it's not clear like what they are until you like stop to really look at it but it basically allows you to just pull the door open with your foot it's like a little cleat so it extends out like six inches and then it has an upward kind of lip with some like little spikies on it on the bottom and you can just dip on the door in the bathroom and you can just put your foot on it and pull and it'll open the door for you Hmm. So it's a way to open it without touching with your no, hands, I, which makes I, sense. Honestly, your that. feet have shoes on them. Yeah, yeah. I've seen that. I s- you've seen you've seen them, but you didn't know what it was. No, I I I did. Now that you say it, I, I I have seen that. I've seen it down in Maryland. Of all the places I've seen it at, I've seen it down um, wherever the the baseball camp we used to go to was near Aberdeen. Uh, there was mm-hmm. there was some restaurants down there that had them, and I always thought, what the. Why in Aberdeen? I don't know, but uh, so it's getting a little more wider use. Maybe, maybe it was a, a, an idea that was too early for its time, kind of like the Studebaker. <laughs> yeah, I feel like the um, the what's the word? Not not ergonomics. That's not the right word, but just uh, I've found that they're a little hard. Like they should be a little longer, mm. where like my foot power would be. But they certainly work. So it's been interesting. Huh. I don't know. Well, the idea of just reimagining a lot of this stuff of how we open doors and yeah. how do we not touch things that are unnecessary. It's a really interesting I- idea. I mean, I was just jokingly early on in the COVID-19 stuff. I was, I made like a little silly like video. I was like, hey, I figured out how to be safe opening doors. And I was like reaching as high as I could reach to o- push open a door like the seven foot mark. <laughs> And uh, it's like, no one's touching it here. Like, this is the safe zone. You know, the very bottom or the very top. Well, on, but, on an airplane, you don't really don't have a lot of, I guess, the restrooms on an aircraft. They have funky doors, those bifold doors typically, because uh, mm-hmm. they're smaller. 
and everything is so tight. But I, you know, I've seen some discussion about antimicrobial surfaces uh, for the restrooms on the airplanes, but I really haven't seen that for anything in the past generic passenger area. Like the overhead bins are just whatever, and the yeah. seats in front of you and the t- tray tables and the armrests are just injection molded plastic parts. It looks like mm-hmm. no, no magic in those. Boy, it seems like yeah. a good time to. I mean, it makes fix that. it makes sense to have these, yeah, these adhesives or whatever it is, where it just like, hey, makes this a really inhospitable place for bacteria and yeah. viruses and microbes to live. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, so, it does, and it doesn't. I mean, it wouldn't involve changing. Oh, maybe it would involve changing the certification of the aircraft, just because anything that's stuck permanently inside the aircraft would at least have to do a burn test to see if it catch fire or smoke and all mm-hmm. those kind of things. So maybe there's some certification involved in getting that yeah. film in. Everything. 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 Yeah. Well, good. That's what it's... Well, yeah. I mean, positives that will come from this, I'm sure. I mean, you never know. This might just reduce spreading just the general common cold for years to come. Yeah. But so let's talk about Embraer. So briefly, they're developing a new turboprop. And part of the reason seems like, A, they've had a lot of experience in mm-hmm. this. And there's just really not much competition in the turboprop market at the moment. Right. Why do you think that is? Well, because there's not a lot of new technology in it, and uh, you know, GE is talking about making a turboprop engine at a significantly reduced cost by, I think it was 3D printing parts of the, of the engine. Pratt and Whitney has owned that market forever with the PT6 and the variants of the PT6, and the and the the Beach King Air has been sort of the gold standard through all the, all that time as twin engine turboprop, pretty reliable. Good, good on fuel burn, easy to fly. It's really easy to fly, quite honestly. And uh, so it's, and there's a lot of them around, so you can buy them used. Those aircraft will last forever if they're maintained. And the PT6 is a low cost operate engine. It just hasn't been a lot of new stuff out. So if, if Embraer wanted to bring some of their newer technology, and Embraer has a ton of new technology in all their, all their jets, if they want to bring that into the application of the turboprop and sort of upgrade the turboprop, that, would, that could actually make some sense. First, I'm making it a little more aerodynamic. A uh, little lower fuel burn would be great. Uh, put some Garmin in it. I know Beach has put some Garmin avionics inside the, the King Airs. And uh, I think there's an opportunity for Embraer to make some money in this marketplace. And with the separation from Boeing, they probably need to do it. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I know uh, Embraer has a great reputation for their turboprops and yeah, I mean, it's funny that it seems like everything is jets these days, but it clearly isn't that way. That's just mainly like the longer middle range commercial sector, right? But mm-hmm. it seems like there still is a a viable market for for turboprop. So that's interesting. Yeah, that Honda, no one else wants to tackle that, and if they're going to tackle it, yeah, well, it's surprising how seems like a good yeah, and it's surprising how well Honda jets done in South America and Central America. There are big marketplaces down south, and that has tended to be a turboprop market. So there's a lot of countries in which a turboprop makes total, total sense in terms of efficiency because you're not flying that far. It's comfortable. So Embraer's got a, a, got a good concept going. And then Nextcom, they have a new design uh, their, of their Aeromax flat panel antenna. And so tell me a little bit about these SATCOM, or these SATCOM radome antennas. So what does the flat design do? Like, why is it different? Just electronically steered. It means there's no mechanical components to, to pivot or to rotate. or And it can respond faster to tracking because it's electronically steered. It can move quicker than a mechanical system could to lock into a spacecraft or to multiple spacecraft in some cases. And it can do that in certain applications. It's a little lower profile. doesn't have to stand up so proud on the aircraft. So that means... Less drag. I'm not sure really how much less drag there is, quite honestly. They always make up these numbers. But aircraft, where these radomes are installed and these aircraft uh, antennas are installed, they're not the most efficient parts of the aircraft anyway in terms of aerodynamics. So, uh, But then the Nextcom just makes a simplified thing. And they've been, they're down in Atlanta, and they've been working with Georgia Tech, it appears like, to develop this set of antennas. they got a couple other competing products on the marketplace so they have to get through that and nextcom hasn't done anything in terms of aircraft certification so that's all going to be due to them they have to partner with somebody to design a radome and to get the thing installed so like a standard arrow could help them as a company to get the get the design figured out and get it installed on aircraft and check it out but 
Uh, and we're going to we're going to see more and more and more of the electronically steered antennas. That's coming. All right. And so in our final segment here, we're going to cover. Um, so again, the uh, the Textron company uh, they were cited for failing to protect workers in an explosion just by OSHA recently. Of course, this this explosion took place back in December, and. Alan, was this an autoclave that exploded? Right. An autoclave in what is called plant three. And I used to work in plant three for a number of years. I worked in plant three. So I know where this is. The autoclave uh, in the back part of plant three is probably 60 foot diameter. And it is massive. It is one of those massive feats of engineering. Whenever you saw it, that man, that thing is huge. And they used to make starship parts back there. So the, the beach starship was a twin engine turboprop pusher plane that was all carbon fiber. They used to make whole wing sections back there. They made all the Premier and the Horizon fuselages in that autoclave. So some of the bigger jets were all made back there in Plant Three. That's where they also had the fiber. At least they used to have the fiber placement machines to to wind. Um, fuselages for those aircraft. They're not making those anymore. But the autoclave looks like part of it let loose and exploded and hurt several people. And that's, I think we all get very complacent about autoclaves, quite honestly, just because you're around them so often and they seem docile enough, but they're pressurized <laughs> and, and they're massive. And so if anything substantial were to happen, uh, some sort of structural failure, it would be a huge explosion, and it was. And yeah. the employees at Textron are so. I mean, obviously, we we are, you know we think about the people that got hurt there and, and wish them well on the recovery. Uh, but there could have been a lot more people in the factory. It happened just after Christmas. It was early in the morning when it let go. I haven't seen any descriptions of anything um, where it was an operator error sort of thing or some sort of fail system that went bad. I haven't seen any of that, but they only find Textron like thirteen thousand dollars. It makes you just think it's yeah, which is nothing, which is nothing, yeah, right? Like that's mm -hmm. yeah. It makes you think it's just one of these weird failure events that they're going to have to evaluate and see if they can find ways to inspect the autoclaves, make sure they don't have that happen again. And maybe it was just particular to that particular autoclave because that autoclave has got to be going on forty years old. It's been there a while. It's not young. No. Yeah. No. Well, and along that same line, uh, I want to talk briefly about fire suppressing foam. So read an article recently um, on AIN online mm. about is it more trouble than it's worth? And it sounds overwhelmingly like it's way more trouble than it's worth. I mean, this seems like one of those crazy poisonous cancer causing it's corrosive to planes. I mean, one manufacturer, one plane manufacturer said that if a plane is exposed to it. They recommend replacing the wheels and the brakes, which is like a million dollar fix mm -hmm. apparently to this one business jet. Yeah. This stuff sounds like a nightmare. And it and apparently there's one false discharge every six weeks on average for the last 16 years. Every six weeks? We're just filling it. Really? Filling a hangar with foam by accident. That's what the report said. Wow. That seems like a lot more than I thought it was. That's a nightmare. Not to mention a person died in 2014 over in Europe because they got trapped in a hangar that filled with foam. What a terrible way to go. Well, it's supposed to su so, suck the oxygen out so things don't burn, right? If you take the fuel away, which uh, you take the oxygen away, it, you can suppress fires. That's what it does. And it is aggressive. I know that it's aggressive. And, I, and when I worked at Beach, well, I think, I don't know if Learjet had it, but definitely Beach had it. And we were very aware of not setting that thing off by accident. That was a big thing it was in the I mean, if i remember correctly it was in the jpats area which was the little single engine trouble prop that uh, beach made as a trainer for the air force and that hangar i believe had that system i don't know if it went off when i was there but it wouldn't surprise me if you listen name those statistics then it would say it would have went off at some point over the last 20 years uh the, the problem with it and I think it was an industry, an insurance industry push to put it in. That was the first thing because you have these very expensive aircraft. And you have multiple of them. If one of them were to catch fire, that would spread to all of them. So it could be a huge insurance payout to cover all those aircraft. So for the cost of putting this suppression system in, if if there was some sort of fire, they could stop it. That was the thought process. But unintended consequences are is that when you put chemicals on aircraft, all the aircraft component manufacturers need to go evaluate it and some of them are not going to design against that corrosive material so that just means they're going to have to replace parts and that ends up being expensive too so you know what was what was what was the worst condition 
being safer in the hangar is probably the best thing you can do. And this fire suppression system uh, doesn't seem to be all that beneficial over time. And I wonder if it's still going to be enforced. You know, as we get more and more data, it seems like we're going to unwind some of these things, maybe disable them and put in other systems that aren't as aggressive towards the aircraft itself. Yeah, well, and and I think part of this um, was that the hangars used to be more costly than the planes that they housed mm-hmm. like way back in the day. And now that's obviously not the case at all, no, like not even close. No, not even close. And, and so then you start talking about we're trying to save maybe this hangar and yet we're sacrificing the way more expensive aircraft inside. Um, and then also there was a lot of debate about the company. So 3M started phasing out the use of, I think it was Teflon in it as a known like hazardous to, to humans uh, additive. <laughs> yeah. And then DuPont took up the uh, making this foam and they've been lobbying again. So I guess 3M created a safer alternative and 3M lo- has been lobbying to like not like, no, we want to keep making it our way, the unsafe way essentially. Mm. So there's also some like some of that going on. This is a really interesting like multifaceted debate about it. But most people are saying like, look, this, this foam was mainly used for getting like fuel spills like preventing right. fuel spills yeah. and like, and those never happen anymore. No. They said like, this isn't a realistic fire threat any longer. <laughs> like it's not 1960. Well, I'll tell you what changed that. So, I'll tell you what changed that. Environmental regulations change that. If you have a fuel spill, you got a big bill because you have to go clean up that mess. And you're probably, especially like if you have a big fuel dump, if, if, you, if you overfill an airplane, particularly in Europe, if you overfill an airplane and it starts pouring fuel out the fuel vents on the wingtips, you got an expensive bill to go fix. So that's what really had initially drove it. But all the airplane manufacturers made sure that didn't happen anymore. They put systems in so the aircraft didn't leak fuel everywhere, which is a tremendous Makes bonus. Sense. Right. All right. Well, that'll do it for today's episode of Struck. If you're new to the show, thank you so much for listening. And please leave a review and subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Check out the WeatherGuard Lightning Tech YouTube channel for video episodes, full interviews, and short clips from the show. And follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Our handle is at WG Lightning. Tune in next Tuesday for another great episode on aviation, aerospace engineering, and lightning protection. Strike Tape, WeatherGuard Lightning Tech's proprietary lightning protection for radomes, provides unmatched durability for years to come. If you need help with your radome lightning protection, reach out to us at weatherguardaero.com. That's weatherguardaero.com.